There are many places to find inspiration for your homebrew rules in your Dungeons & Dragons game, so when Pathfinder 2nd Edition came out, I knew it would be a great source of inspiration to steal from. Now, I have read through the rulebook, but I have never actually played Pathfinder, so I'm bringing in one of the biggest Pathfinder YouTubers known at once. We're going to dive into seven different house rules that you can use from Pathfinder in your Dungeons & Dragons game, so let's go. So we're going behind enemy lines with the Pathfinder YouTuber known at ones because who better to take some Pathfinder rules and adapt them to D&D than somebody who plays both systems. Welcome, man. Hey, happy to be here and excited to be talking about the system I love and how we can incorporate it into the game you love. Heck yeah. Uh, are you ready to betray Pathfinder entirely and, <laughs> and share all its secrets? You know what? I might get some uh, some flack for it, but let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> First one, I've got seven tips here that we're going to break down. I got four of them. You got three of them. We're going to go back and forth here. The first one is the thing that impressed me most whenever Pathfinder 2nd Edition came out. Because when it came out, I was like... I'm going to steal some stuff. Like <laughs> I gotta, I gotta check this book out. Like what's in here, you know? Huh? huh? Yeah. Cause they're so similar. I feel like, you know, there's so many TTRPGs out there. Yeah. Especially those, those so classic, similar. you know, Euro fantasy combat centric mm -hmm. D20 systems. You know, those are so easy to rip from each other. The thing that impressed me the most was the, the action system, the three action system where instead of in D and D where you have move action, bonus action, and then, you know, reaction. Is there a reaction in Pathfinder? There is. Yep. Okay, cool. Just checking. Um, <laughs> but in Pathfinder, it's you have three action points and you can spend them on movement, 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 or you could do attack, attack, attack. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait a second. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, and because I think the biggest problem that I see, I feel in D&D that you probably don't feel in Pathfinder is mm -hmm. the time when you use your movement and then you're in battle and you do your bonus action buff on yourself and then you take your attack action to do whatever. And then that next turn rolls around and you're already squared off against your enemy. You don't need to move. Mm -hmm. So then you waste your movement. Yeah, no, that, that like definitely... That comes up and and e even in pathfinder 2 a new a new player might still do that but you know like we're talking about you can attack 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 at level one yeah. to adapt it now to D, D is there's this really cool thing that pathfinder did of these three actions and you can use them and stuff so i think to tr the, the problem i'm trying to solve for fifth edition is this this wasting of movement right and i have uh I think my last homebrew video I did, I have like, oh, you can spend movements to do certain things, to interact with objects or to catch something somebody throws at you is five or 10 movement or something like that. And as a DM, you can spend people's movement instead of just having it be, you know, moving around the battlefield. Or if you stand up from prone, it costs 15 feet of movement instead of half, but that's a whole nother thing. Mm -hmm. um, what if, and this is my, what if I've not brand this, this is full disclaimer. I have not done this at my game table. <laughs> um, so just you guys out there, I'm just throwing that out there is what if you spend all of your movement, not 30 feet, just all of your movement for an attack at disadvantage. That's, Something I'd be interested in playing around with to see if you are already in combat, you're there, and you just get another attack, right? And this is um, on top of your normal attack, yes? Yeah, so you'd have your, you know, you make your attack, or if you have extra attack, you make your two attacks, and then that would normally be it. But if you're already standing there, you're already in combat, you can spend your full movement and make another attack. Mm. So... I mean, it, it's it's out, and if you're if you're super like, oh, that's too strong. You could, sure make them spend a bonus action as well. You can use your bonus action and all of your movement or whatever. So I think it's an interesting way to solve that problem. But I, again, <laughs> I would not necessarily sign up on it yet. I'd want to play test that. But I just that's love my the, first one. I love the flavor of the concept. Like action just, system aside, but like yeah. foregoing movement and everything. You know, you think of it is is five e a six second round or a ten second round. Six seconds. Six seconds. Yeah. So you think of that six second as you are just flailing uh, 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 back and going forth all with your in. weapon. So, you know, all yeah, like that first swing or two might be accurate. But after that, you're just yeah. flailing uh, all over the place. And I, right. I like that, that, you know, it's less accurate. But, you know, you might hit something. Yeah. For sure. For sure. <laughs> okay. Your turn. Well, then how about we jump into one of my favorite things they added to Pathfinder 2E, which is varied initiative roles. Depending on how an encounter starts, you might not just roll initiative. I know in 5e, you typically roll uh, a dex roll. Um, right. In Pathfinder, they made it wisdom uh, for perception. But Like it, straight up, like all of them? Or are you saying... So so base, if you're just rolling okay. standard initiative, it's, it's, per, it's uh, the perception skill, which is wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's say you're a rogue and you were already hiding in the bushes when combat starts. Well... Because you're hiding, you can roll stealth 
for your initiative. For your initiative. Yeah. The you, the book says you can do this with anything that makes sense. They say if it's so cool, man. At, at the start of combat you're hanging from a chandelier, you could roll acrobatics for your initiative. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, so, and as soon yeah. as as soon as you, I saw that this was going to be your thing, because we we know, we I, we haven't talked about these yet, but I saw a little, a little sneak a little sneak into our notes here. I saw what you did. I was like, oh, my brain started running with it, and I love it because it rewards creativity mm-hmm. instead of just it's your dexterity score, and that, right. <laughs> that's it. Like like every time, no matter what, it's just how quickly you are to react to combat. Yeah. I feel like my chronomancy wizard. Maybe he uses his intelligence or his spellcasting modifier because he can use time and it's more so based on his time perception of things like that. Yeah. Or a uh, uh, thing I liked is, uh, you know, those fights that you've had where people are, are lying and it's like on the edge of maybe like about to fight or not. And somebody's trying to false like like feign something and, mm-hmm. and deceive them. Yeah. That's their initiative roll deception check. Make it yes. a, or like, there we go. Roll for combat. You, yours is going to be a deception check, but they're probably proficient in and they're, that's why they did that thing. And yeah. I love your rogue analogy uh, or your rogue example of hiding in the shadows. Of course they should have a stealth check be right? their initiative thing. Right. Yeah. So, and I, I love so it. Cool. it. It rewards, like you said, it rewards player creativity and it makes mm. them think about pre-battle prep even like you know before initiative has been rolled what are they doing and you know the players yeah the players can think you know how can i flavor this to give myself an advantage back on your intelligence example maybe your your wizard you know is analyzing the battlefield and trying to strategize in case something goes down then you can say you know i i you say you're doing that a few minutes before encounter starts and then when it does start you can be like can i roll intelligence for initiative because I yeah. was strategizing the whole time, you know, it's awesome. And I, I mean, I think you pointed out, I didn't even think about that. Cause you know, you're the one that plays the system <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is like, it's, it's almost like a skill challenge. I do a lot of, I love skill challenges, but it's like, how can I creatively use these skills to start a fight, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which yep. sets me up better for the fight instead of it just being like, ah, uh, and then, okay, roll for initiative. And like yeah. everything that led up to it didn't matter as much. This makes it matter a little more. So I love that. I, I love, love it. That. And I love that it makes, you know, if your character has a bad dexterity, doesn't mean they're going to go last. I like it. Right. True too. True. And I, cause I feel like, you know, the perception, whether it's default or not, like I've definitely had people be able to like, okay, cool. Whether it's through a feat or through some sort of bonus level up perk that I do as well. Um, like, all right, you now, now your initiative score comes from your, this thing. Cause you're better at this thing. Right. I've done that before, but this is like on the fly dynamic every time. So I think yep. it's really interesting. Yeah. I cool. love it. Keeps things fresh, you know? Yep. All so, right. uh, my three. rule number three, is my favorite, my second favorite thing that I really liked about Pathfinder that stood out to me uh, was critical success and critical failure, right? For sure. Because I love me some nat ones and some nat twenties, <laughs> right? But you know those times, specifically in combat when this happens, where you the thing has a 15 armor class and you roll to hit and you get like a 29 <laughs> like and it's like a joke and everyone's like like 29 oh yeah that hits for sure <laughs> right. you know like really really hits you know but like a 16 also hits compared to a 29 right i feel like the 29 should have something more more hit to it you know what i mean mm-hmm. so in in pathfinder i think is it plus 10 it's, and minus 10? Yeah, plus 10, minus 10 over any DC whatsoever right. is right. a critical success or a critical failure. Right. And this, So that does that mean that you absolutely succeed on it? Uh, so d- typically, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, most things in 2nd Edition Pathfinder have four different results. You know, for a lot of spells, a critical success mm. saving throw means you take no damage, you know. Um, but a, a normal, okay, gotcha. like 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 on a fireball, if you critically succeed yeah. your reflex save, you take no damage. You completely dodge the fireball. Okay. If you so it's baked succeed. into the system. Exactly. Itself. Okay. Yep. So I think for D and D, like plus and minus ten in Dungeons and Dragons is a little bit beefier of a number to get to right. because it's you know we don't have as much numbers that we're adding compared to Pathfinder. Mm-hmm. So things I've done before, and this is in Fifth Edition's gameplay mechanics rules as written is oh if you fail by five or succeed that there's there's failures where if you fail by five something worse happens i feel like it could be something where it's like five over but i feel like if if you have five points over just be a critical strike 
you're going to get crits <laughs> all the time and it's going to run away with from you. So maybe in D&D you have the maybe you do stick with the 10 point thing for criticals and 10 points over the armor class is a critical strike as well. And that that could work as well. Makes life My a, lot, group, a lot scarier for your, your cloth wearing wizards <laughs> and stuff, you know. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's true. Because, again, anytime you have a homebrew rule that is used uh, with the players, it's also used against them, too, mm -hmm. with the monsters. So I totally <laughs> agree. Um, uh, so but what I would do, and this is what I would sign off on right now, is if you have uh, if you critically succeed, so you're over 10, it's a damage die more. So one die of damage more it would be I feel like a simple it, it addresses the fact that it's more than it was. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. like even more of a hit so it feels like oh sweet the armor class is 15 you get a 25 to hit okay cool add an extra die damage or add an extra d6 or something that's just a little bit more to feel that crit maybe not doubling everything but yeah go to number four so we can uh, uh not th <laughs> create this video too <laughs> all right well this is a big one and kind of controversial when it comes to pathfinder uh pathfinder 2e has 42 unique conditions that can be applied to players uh, and what? any entity. Now, this is a bloated number because things like hostile, friendly, hidden, observed, those wow. all count as conditions. But there's some really cool, unique ones that I think could easily be homebrewed yeah. into your 5e game. This is the yeah. rule I'm the most excited about that you have because I, I think this really could add some stuff in here for so it. They're so cool. So the first one's an easy one. Now, I believe 5e already does have a frightened condition. Uh, yes. But in, in Pathfinder, frightened is actually a super common condition because using intimidation in combat to demoralize if they fail their will save mm -hmm. they become frightened for one round which gives them a minus one to everything saving throws armor class attack rolls it's great and now question mm -hmm. is it also ability checks yes yep all okay. rolls okay. and dcs it's okay. so good so like yeah and it lets you do some cool combos you know if you want your your grapple check to be a little more accurate you can intimidate first giving them a minus one to their, up. to their fortitude, yeah. and then you grab them. It's awesome. Frightened, or the, the fear or frightened condition in D&D is you have disadvantage while the, the source of your fear is in front of you or you can still see it, right? Um, and then there's even further things about fear that get confusing about if you have to run away from it or not, but then right. there's certain spells that make you run away versus not have to run away. You can't move closer. Anyway, um, to talk about this, though, I think if I could turn this, so I've taken the frightened condition from Pathfinder that you just said, and I'm turning it into overwhelmed for D&D 5th edition. Um, and uh, also, let me say this too. Uh, oh, here we go. Let me see if this works. Time out. <laughs> so are you frozen? in place am i frozen in place oh dang it didn't work oh, I, didn't know if I, I didn't know if my timeout I mean, would like i can be frozen time you out <laughs> no no you're fine um so uh uh in in the description i'm gonna have uh I, anytime i do homebrew stuff i have a pdf on the dms guild that i update all the stuff on so all of that's gonna be it's a completely free pdf uh that you can download all these little rules on so i'm gonna put on there is overwhelmed and it's uh minus two to all saving throws and attack rolls and your armor class um when if you are overwhelmed for whatever condition if you feel you know because like, i feel like i chose the word overwhelmed because frightened is already conditioned overwhelmed is like this is too much this is too much i like, like that yeah it's, it's like a stressful sanity yeah, stress kind of crack. yeah 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 so and it's minus two to say and i choose minus two because in D D there is not like this little incremental minus ones here minus mm -hmm. ones there it's there's plus twos and minus twos there's plus fives and minus fives and then there's advantage disadvantage type stuff so i'm choosing the, the minus two mm -hmm. to saving throws attack rolls and armor class because you're so over you know so yeah. there's there's that um and this is going to come up again when you talk about something else so okay. i'm that is overwhelmed for all combat rolls minus two to all combat rolls there's my 5e version so give me the next one nice so the next one is super unique to the the pathfinder death dying system whereas 5e again correct me if i'm wrong is you roll until you get three a total of three successes or three fails correct correct well 2e is a little more complicated the long and short is that <laughs> when you go down you get you are dying one if you succeed your roll you stabilize right then and there, but you're wounded. If you go down again, you start at dying two. And if you ever fail a roll, right. you go down farther. And if you ever hit dying five or dying four, your character is dead. Now, there's a very unique condition that does not even come up that often. Not even that many monsters in the bestiary have it, but it is the doomed condition, 
which that sounds so epic it's so terrifying doom. i i long for the day i can look at my player and go you are doomed, you are doomed. one yeah um <laughs> and it increases that threshold of dying if you're doomed four if you ever fall unconscious at zero you're hit done. points you're right. dead and i think that is the biggest takeaway that i'm seeing this because i'm very familiar with the path by i have a whole homebrew on the how i took that wounded system into DD fifth edition which I'm actually going to get into later but um uh i think i love is that while conscious while alive and fighting you could be closer to dead like mm-hmm. you're they're messing with your actual like your soul i would describe it as some sort of like like devilish soul impact on you to where like if you go unconscious like you're really close to dead or like you're saying you could get this thing stacked up if you're fighting this thing and it's not going well it keeps getting you keep failing your saving throws on whatever effect this creature's doing to you um it can get you even closer to dying so in 5e i would say doomed um uh is an instant death saving throw fail while alive so like normally you have three successes and three failures, like you said, um, but you would just bubble in a fail on that death save right away while conscious, fully fighting. You would just be like, all right, bubble in a death saving throw. That would freak the heck a That's player creepy. out. That's creepy. Yeah. Like, wait, 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 already what? not in your favor. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> so, so yeah, that would be, and, and, and I don't even know, and this would be, I personally, if you've bubbled in all three failures, I wouldn't have the player die instantly. I feel like that would be a little cheap. Yeah, um, but if you did bubble in all three and you have three bubbled in death saves and you go unconscious, you're done. I think that's you're fair. done. So I feel I, that that I love that. And I apologize for all the players that died at this now. If your DMs watch this video and use this on you. <laughs> I, I really want to make a modern day Tomb of Horrors where it, oh, the, the aura doomed. of the entire dungeon just inflicts max doomed on all characters. Doomed you. Yep. You, yep. Oh, God. Tomb of Doom. <laughs> but moving on to some more common conditions you'll find. Most of these will come up, uh, probably I'd say like once every session or two. And I've clumped them all together. They are clumsy, enfeebled, and stupefied. These function similar to frightened, but are more specific. <laughs> clumsy reduces all rolls and DCs specifically for dexterity-based checks and DCs. Uh, enfeebled affects strength. And stupefied affects all mental capacity. So typically, you know, intelligence, oh, wisdom, okay. charisma. Yeah, yeah. Um, on top of that, stupefy is the only special one in that it adds a 20% chance. So you have to roll five or higher whenever you mm-hmm. cast a spell for your spell to just completely fizzle and disappear. Ooh, you lose ooh. the spell slot. Nothing happens. It's awful. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's, um, oh, that's rough, especially mm-hmm. the mental one. Um, and I, I like that because it's like you said, it's similar to the the Frightened thing. So in now to go take it to 5th edition, the Overwhelm thing where you minus two to everything. You're just so overwhelmed just in general with everything. Minus two to freaking everything. This is a little bit more specific. So what I'm calling this is for the D&D 5e. Now, I'm calling this Weakened right uh but specific stat weakened so like strength weakened dexterity weakened i mean i'm sure i could you know, just f- better words like clumsy and enfeebled and stupefied but i'm just going to call it stat weakened right? yeah, so like fair. charisma weakened right like your your uh uh wisdom weakened right so like your right. resistance against those types of things right um and it's basically your abilities modifier is just minus two for that specific thing. And there's effects I've done before where I, you know, there's there's ghosts or whatever, different monsters that can actually affect your actual stat and your stats start to reduce down, right? Yeah. Um, but I would, I always focus on the modifiers. I never focus on those, the actual score numbers, but the I, modifier yeah. minus two and you lose your modifier of that specific stat. I think that's, that's, that's smart. And I honestly think, as a as a, a hobby, as the a genre, uh, we're mo- going to be moving away from the stats as a whole. I could see it in the next. I few totally years agree. To and if they don't, I this. am. <laughs> um, that yeah. now um, leads us to number five for my, for my thing. I loved all those conditions. I loved all those conditions, and I think they're so easily applicable over into D D like we just did um so my number five is i just did a full video on this so i guess i guess a shameless self plug here but <laughs> this legitimately came from pathfinder so um uh is resistance x is what i call it uh which is just the resistance system from pathfinder now i took it and homebrewed it and ran with it in the video uh link for the little description and stuff but instead of resistance just dealing half damage to everything so if you're resistant to fire damage you just take half damage from all fire things you would have fire resist 10 and every time you took fire damage it would just 
low, minus 10 off of that fire damage that you took. Is that exactly how Pathfinder works? That Correct is me exactly how it works, yes. Okay, cool. Um, so is there in Pathfinder, is there any half damage thing? Off the top of my head, no. But what's nice about wow. Resistance X, okay. this whole system, is okay. the game can give it out so much more safely. You know, D&D 5e, yeah, they sure. give out resistance. That's permanent half damage forever. But yeah, yeah resistance, crazy. resistance 2 at level 18 isn't doing all that much. <laughs> right, right. And yeah. I think, and I'll even take that a step farther. The after resistance is immunity. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I believe. So, yeah. <laughs> in in current D D, it's either you take the damage or even vulnerable. Vulnerable is double damage. Then you got uh take the damage normally, then you have uh half, then you have nothing. Right. And that's the whole thing, right? So yeah. I love now, I will say in, in that video, I'm I'll say it here now, uh barbarians in uh D D take half damage from all attacks on them. And I think some people misunderstood what I was saying, so I'll say it here now, is I would not screw with barbarians resistance like that give them half damage and everything cool 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 um i wouldn't do like physical resist five or something like that and then this should be super strong early on and it just gets too complicated i would in general i like using half damage for things but if there's times where you have a tiefling that would you want to give fire resist to earlier on and have it maybe scale with them as they level up that would be a cool thing to where you have your level in fire resist that'd yeah. be interesting yeah like, i like that and you just kind of, you just grows with you to where eventually like fire, like when you're level 10, little bitty piddly fires don't do anything to you, which feels cool and feels accurate instead of just, oh, a half from everything always. Definitely stole that from Pathfinder and <laughs> uh, I'm not, not ashamed of it. So no shame love whatsoever. It. All right. The next one is really cool, but a lot of people have some problems with it. Uh, but I think it could work oh, really yeah. well for D&D &D 5e is shields as a whole. I know one of my big complaints and a lot of people's big complaints is shields in 5th edition. They're just wear it and get plus 2 armor class, right? That's all yep. they do. I am yeah. wearing a shield and then you just literally write in your character's armor class. <laughs> You right. just permanently write it in there. Yeah. And so shields are so much more involved. They are their own mechanic in Pathfinder 2E. And again, without without just going into essays on how it all works, uh, the shield on its own does nothing. If you have your, your steel shield off to your side, it's not giving you any armor class. You need to spend one of your three actions to raise it, and then you get the bonus to armor class. And then, right. as a reaction... If you get attacked, you can shield block, and only certain classes can shield block, but that's a whole other can mm. of worms. Uh, but if you shield block, you reduce oh, the damage yeah. okay. by the hardness. So let's say your steel shield has a hardness of 8. Yeah. You shield block, you take 8 less damage, but yeah. then you and your shield both take the remaining damage, um, and your shield has its own mm. hit point pool. Uh, once your right. shield is below half health, it cannot be used to gain armor or block or anything it is useless oh, wow. while it is broken yes but it can be repaired yeah um, but yeah. if it ever hits zero it is destroyed you can't get yeah. it back so um, i'll yeah. say this just hearing you say that right i can see because i am i am a a D, D 5e boy like that's all i've played i was not in 3.5 edition i have not i'm not big into other tabletop roleplay games i was thrown into D, &D 5e fell in love and never looked back since and i'm just 5e ride or die right so hearing you describe this it's like very like i hear about pathfinders like this crunchy or grindier than numbers mm -hmm. and the thing but it's so accurate like, like all credit to like how like okay you block and you use an action to raise and then the reaction to like you reduce the damage but then the shield could get injured and if it's below so like it has all these if thans but i, I see it's a much more dynamic tanking play style because it is like you feel like you're a tank you know and uh i i i think that's one of the problems in D, &D fifth edition that i am uh another side note to a future video in doing something for martial classes and specifically for tanks i love tanking i love and, and i know in in it's come from mmo rpgs yeah. and that's my <laughs> World of Warcraft background showing there. Oh, but, I feel it, man. Um, um, I, was the, that's, I was the main tank in all of the stuff. So I want to play tanks in D&D, but it just feels weird. So I have a whole another thing I'll go into uh, in a whole separate video for that. But I feel like this, this I'm choosing to take less damage. I'm spending resources to take even less damage. Right. I really love. So here's my here's my D&D &D 5th edition take for it. I've had to write it down so make sure I get make sure I get it right. All right. Is, a bonus action to raise your shield to gain the armor class from it. 
right? So this would be a big nerf to shields if you don't just automatically get plus two AC. Everyone's going to freak out about that. Oh my God, like you just, you don't get plus two AC. You have a shield on your arm. You got to use it. You know right. what I mean? So <laughs> bonus action to raise your shield um, or to, to engage the armor class from your shield, right? Um, and you can say whenever you enter in the combat that you have your shield up. I think that would feel bad if the first round of combat you don't count your shield or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but uh, so bonus action to raise your shield to gain the two armor class from it. But it also has a health pool, like you just said as well. Um, and anytime that you get hit, Every time you get hit, it reduces like the physical resistance that we just talked about, the resistance X. Your shield would have, um, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, all damage resistance X to where it just reduces, let's say three, which is a feat in Dungeons and Dragons, the hardiness or hardened heavy armor master, I think it is, okay. um, where every time you take your take physical damage, uh, you reduce it by three. So you spend a bonus action to use your shield. It would get, raise your armor class. And if you get hit, it reduces your damage you take by three or whatever, however strong the shield is, it would reduce that damage by three. But every time you do that, it would just wear the shield down and you would be spending its hit points instead of your own. So okay. um, it's not, it's kind of like the opposite of what you said with the Pathfinder shield where the extra damage left over damages both, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this version of it, it's almost like you're incrementally dealing or incrementally spending parts of your shield's health to not take your own. And then once the health of the shield drops down to, to zero, it no longer reduces that damage, but you can still block with it and still gain the armor class from it. And it just becomes a normal shield. So I think that's interesting. Yeah. Again, not play tested. <laughs> Let me just throw that out there. This is just also some behind the scenes of like homebrewing. Like you told me this not that long ago. And this is my few second thoughts on what okay. I would try and do, you know, which is actually yeah, what we're doing in your video, which we'll talk yeah, about more in a second. <laughs> for sure. But yeah, it's, it's all about throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, yeah. I like it. I like what you with the, what you've done to, to twist it. Uh, my only thing is there should be some drawback to to your shield breaking. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Other yeah, than just I see that. Not being yeah. able to reduce damage. I don't know, like on the spot, spending the time. I don't know the exact answer. Um, maybe well, right. half I think AC once it's broken. The reason why but. I didn't, the reason why I didn't, and this is actually we're gonna definitely talk about this in your video, um, mm -hmm. is I try and keep all my homebrews on on in line with the system that I'm homebrewing, right? So in D and D, there is not item. Your items can't break in general. There's I think some there's some weapons where if you roll a nat one on an attack roll, it breaks or something like that. <laughs> which I love that for the regular. That's cool. Okay, oh, yeah. cool, great, sure. Um, but uh, uh, in general, things don't have items don't have durability. So I'm very hesitant to give a shield durability. Although I totally see why, and I would like that as a player. I would like that because I got to repair my shield and in my in my long rest i'm gonna make a blacksmithing check to try you know i i totally see that and i'd love that but in 5e things don't break <laughs> right so that's why i didn't off the bat but i totally see why you'd want to but also the, uh, the hard part in that same line is 5e is beautiful for its simplicity so right. you know you, you start adding these these little extra things here mm -hmm. extra things there and that simplicity starts to get a little more complicated right and is that, it worth that, it do we do it exactly is it, yeah. number seven number seven is uh the wounded system that you referenced earlier right. is um the death uh the how death works in in, in pathfinder and i i hate the yo-yo uh whack-a-mole death saves <laughs> where healing word healing word <laughs> healing word i lit oh my gosh i hate <laughs> i watch you know i've watched streams of, of people play and they'll literally at the table be like no 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 don't just heal me the minimum you can Ugh. and then I'll go back down and then like spend your healing like because somebody had a bonus action heal. So don't spend a higher level spell slot. Just do the first level spell and then I'm back. You know, I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, no, 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 no. That no. has to be removed from every like I, I right. probably my the first thing I ever homebrewed was this <laughs> like the, yeah, i was like wow. i gotta change death saves i remember I it was it was a them. big topic of controversy like probably two three years mm -hmm. ago healing word really? was like the the big no-no oh yeah <laughs> so what i do what i now okay now when i say what i do one of my many homebrews as you if anyone who knows my, my channel i have hundreds of homebrews not any game do i use all of them all at once i have a whole nother video that i talk about like how you choose which ones to use or not but um uh, this specific one that I've stolen from Pathfinder, thanks for that, um, well, is... I don't, uh, I don't know why I'm saying you're, you're welcome. welcome. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you have my blessing. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so how this one works specifically is, and I like this, and then, so this is D&D 5e version, is in order to die, let me just clarify this, in order to die, you have to be unconscious and have three death save fails. Everybody understands that. That's kind of basic. It's almost like obvious that I said that. But here's how it works is this is my death saves and this is me being unconscious or conscious. I don't know if you can see, you can't see my hands. It's fine. I can't um, see anything. <laughs> but uh, you get three death saving throw fails. Okay, great. So you're fighting, you're fighting, you're fighting. You fall unconscious. Okay. You roll in your death saves. Let's say you get a success or whatever. And then someone heals you and you stand back up. As soon as you stand back up, you burn a death save fail from the act of being brought back from the brink, right? You are now weaker than you were before. Not fighting wise, it doesn't negatively impact you fighting wise, you still have all your pluses and all your good stuff, but you're closer to death and you feel closer to death because you've had that bubbled in death saving throw, like we just talked about with the doomed condition that we said. Right. But this is kind of that like, oh, ah, I get brought back. Okay, now you're here. So now let's say you have two, you have two fails left and you're fine. You get knocked unconscious again, oh no. Um, you roll a death save and you fail, right? So now you only have one left. Um, your cleric comes over and they heal you and they, they get you back up. You get back up, but you burn. Every time you get back up, you burn a death save in order to do so. Now you have three deaths. You don't have any left. And the next time you go unconscious, you're dead. Oh, so, right? so, you, so you, for you, they, they carry over. If you go yeah. down and fail, that's two. Yep. Oof. All right. Well, brutal. Well, so so I would say if you fail a death saving throw, that's a fail for mm -hmm. sure. But the act of being brought back burns a death saving throw fail, which is similar, which is basically the wounded condition, mm -hmm. because when you come back up, you're easier to go back down or whatever. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've I have ran this before and I loved it. Now I'm sure you know it's a more deadly campaign. It's more deadly. So you mm -hmm. know disclaimers there. Yeah. But <laughs> when that player went down and they came back up. They had that death saving throw fail. They're like, oh my gosh, like we have to protect them. And I, I'd say this now, I like in, in fights, sometimes you don't want the, like not sometimes, all the time. I don't like fights that are just like, kill them before they kill us. Yeah. Like I like to have the theme or some sort of gimmick, you know, oh, that's, yeah. that's happening, an alternative win condition or whatever. Yes. So that fight became so epic because that one player was no death. Save. The next time they went unconscious, they were dead. And everyone then had to work together to protect that one player. And it was so cool to see abilities be used in ways that they normally don't to save the player, to be able to, I mean, at the, the fight was essentially kind of won at that point, but it was still really high stakes because that player was so walking the line. So mm -hmm. I've loved it and it was really cool. Um, but that's the uh, straight from Pathfinder. So there's, <laughs> there's that. But yeah, dude, that's 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 all seven. Thank yeah. you, No Nat, for coming in here and sharing your Pathfinder uh, expertise with us. Thank you for having me on. It was an absolute blast. It was a blast for sure. And we're gonna continue this blast over on your channel. Oh, and yeah. any of my any of my home brewers out there in the dungeon crew, um, we're gonna dive into just home brewing, mm -hmm. not specifically D and D, specifically Pathfinder, but just home brewing your games for any game. I mean, and now, of course, primarily we're have a D twenty system, <laughs> right? Well, and as I said that, uh, we both were like, eh, like <laughs> mainly for Pathfinder and D and D, of course. Yeah. And this is gonna be where we're both coming from. But it's just how do you homebrew stuff? And how does it all work? So love it. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Now that was fun. And I know this is going to be a longer video than usual, but I hope the conversation was both entertaining and efficient all at the same time. So if you like videos like this and want to see more of me collaborate with other people and bring them in and talk about D&D &D and different parts of it, then comment down below and let me know. I really do love talking with other content creators out there. And it's especially fun to go across platform to a similar D20 system of Pathfinder to be able to come together and talk D&D. &D. And over on his channel, we talked about homebrew in general and link for that video will be down in the description, but we talk about how to homebrew for your game. Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons. And speaking of homebrews, if you guys want more homebrew content for your games, then I just started doing monthly homebrew PDFs over on my Patreon to help your games out. I've done point by character creation stuff, wild magic tables, magic items, magic tattoos, an entire city. And I just love making this stuff for you guys and your continued support literally helped make me do this and make more videos. If you haven't noticed, I'm making two videos a month now, and that's all thanks to my Patreon. I want to keep making these things bigger and bigger and make more content to take your games to the next level and make Make your life easier at the same time. So if any of that sounds interesting, click right here to join my Patreon. Click right here to check out No Nats video where we talk about homebrew of all kinds of systems. And until next time, stay creative. Think outside that box. Peace.